Eyewitness News presents special coverage of the coronavirus response. Good evening, everyone. Glad you could join us on this Wednesday for a special edition of Eyewitness News at 7 on WIOU. I'm Nick Toma. And I'm Candace Kelly. Within a matter of weeks, the coronavirus crisis has changed the way we live and interact with each other. Social distancing, of course, is now a part of our daily life. And concerns about our health and well-being are paramount. Now, in the next hour, we will be answering some of your questions concerning the coronavirus pandemic. We have a health expert, several of them, with us tonight to field those questions, and we will also take a much closer look at how the coronavirus is impacting all aspects of our life. Well, let's begin with the latest numbers from the Pennsylvania Department of Health. There are now 1,127 cases of coronavirus in the state across 44 counties. The death toll also has increased now to 11. That includes a confirmed death in Luzerne County. There are now 10 counties ordered to stay at home. The state is now working to purchase masks and ventilators and to make sure that hospitals are ready for an increase in patients. The governor announced the COVID-19 Working Capital Access Program that will offer some loans to small businesses impacted by the virus. And we are keeping all of this information constantly updated for you on our website, pahomepage.com. The numbers have risen sharply since the first case of novel coronavirus surfaced in Pennsylvania earlier this month. It's changed our day to day lives so much in such a short period of yeah. time. Eyewitness News reporter Mark Hiller live for us in Wilkesbury tonight to explain. Mark. Nick and Candace on a typical Wednesday evening cafe Toscana behind me would be bustling with the business of a dinner crowd, but instead it's closed until further notice. Changes caused by the coronavirus crisis have been life altering from the way we work and worship to the very way we interact with each other. March 6th, the day the inevitable became reality in Pennsylvania with its first cases of COVID-19. We've been preparing for coronavirus for a while. We had things in place and uh, I think we're ready for this. But none of us could really be ready to comprehend how quickly COVID-19 would spread in Pennsylvania and impact our lives. What started as single cases in Wayne and Delaware counties soon grew across the Commonwealth by the dozens daily and now by the hundreds per day. The 1,000 total cases plateau eclipsed in the Keystone State in less than three weeks. Pennsylvania recorded its first COVID-19 related death on March 18th, with the number of associated fatalities growing to nearly a dozen in a single week. It's hard to believe. It really is. You never think it would come to this, but here we are, you know, I don't know what we can do. Two unheard of terms soon became common in northeastern and central Pennsylvania, panic buying and social distancing. Schools closed the week of March 16th and houses of worship were shuttered. The very same week, Governor Tom Wolf took unprecedented action, ordering non-essential small businesses in the Commonwealth to close. By the end of that week, the order extended to businesses not considered life-sustaining. Downtowns became virtual ghost towns. The impact of closures felt even by many businesses that are allowed to stay open. The non-essential life businesses down here um, are not here, and usually we're uh, based on walk-up clientele, and uh, obviously we're not seeing a lot of that. Um, so it's definitely uh, different this week. It's, uh, it's slower. As many of us struggled to embrace the daily message from Pennsylvania Department of Health Secretary Rachel Levine. To stay calm, to stay home, and to stay safe. We move forward in this novel coronavirus pandemic with uneasiness. I think it's because we are dealing with the unknown and we're not too good at that. We like to plan our lives out. We like to plan every move we make. So when we get the curveball, we're kind of like this can't be happening. And she speaks for many of us. And as you heard earlier, Governor Wolf has ordered 10 Pennsylvania counties to shelter in place. Those counties include Monroe, Northampton, and Lehigh. The mandate affects more than 6 million people, or about half of Pennsylvania's population. In Wilkesbury tonight, Mark Hiller, Eyewitness News. Incredible. Mark, thank you. And Eyewitness News is closely following the COVID-19 virus for our viewers. Tonight, we are joined by three local medical experts who will be answering your questions and concerns. And joining us in the studio is Dr. Gerald Maloney. He's Chief Medical Officer, Geisinger Hospitals. And um, 
Dr. Matthew Berger is a local psychiatrist. And joining us remotely tonight, Dr. Jeffrey Jerry, infectious disease specialist and a senior vice president of medical and academic affairs for St. Luke's Health Network. And we appreciate you guys all for taking your time out of what we know are busy schedules tonight. Let's begin with Dr. Maloney. Can you please explain what the symptoms are of coronavirus or COVID-19? Sure, the coronavirus has symptoms very similar to influenza and many other viral diseases, but what it seems mostly is fever and respiratory symptoms. So severe lower respiratory symptoms, severe cough, shortness of breath, that sort of thing. So not so much the headache and uh, gastrointestinal complaints with some viruses, but more the fever and breathing. Quick follow up to that question. When the, the pandemic first started, people kept saying, well, listen, it's flu season. This is just the flu. We know now there is a difference. What is the difference? So there's several differences. First of all, it's a completely different virus. It has a completely different DNA. So the influenza vaccine does not have any activity against it whatsoever, nor do some of the drugs that we have that do treat influenza. So there is a, a major a lack of uh, treatment options for the uh, for coronavirus if one were to get it. The symptoms are you know, fairly similar to the flu. The season is what it is, but the, uh, the outcome from no treatment and from having no way to prevent it is the, the significant difference between the coronavirus and influenza. Interesting, okay, uh, Dr. Jerry, let's bring in you remotely now and ask you the next question. We're hearing that some people who get the coronavirus are losing their sense of taste and smell as kind of a symptom, is that true? Yes, that is true. Um, there are a number of different symptoms that have been associated with this, and uh, Dr. Maloney certainly touched on them, but the loss of taste and smell certainly has been reported. It uh, has to be said, though, that none of these symptoms are present in everyone. Right, there are no like universal symptoms, and one might argue, well, if you had the flu, you would lose your sense of taste and smell anyway, right? It's certainly possible with a number of different disorders that affect the respiratory tract that that can happen. So uh, by no means, if someone loses their sense of taste and smell, should they assume that they have coronavirus 19. All right, let me ask Dr. Berger a question here. We hear about the physical impact of the virus, but what type of impact is this having on our mental health? A lot of people are very anxious right now. Yeah, I mean, I think anxiety disorders are definitely on the rise. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of what I call the worried well. You know, this is a person who coughs twice and decided he needs to go to the emergency room and get tested. Uh, as the other doctor said, I mean, one of the things you have to look for is upper respiratory stuff is really not related to corona in the most part. So if you've got, you know, sinus infections and sneezing and sniffling, you probably don't. Now, that doesn't mean it's 100% rule out. But I think people in general were herd animals. And unfortunately, we get caught up in this herd mentality. Like, everybody wants to be tested. I should be checked. You know, we're flooding the emergency rooms. Uh, the anxiety level of people is way up, um, and I think it's really hurting you know, people more almost than the actual illness, because the vast majority of people don't have the illness. You know, there is a, a, a significant number that do, sure. but most people don't, yet we're all being sort of processing it in our head as if it was sort of the bubonic plague, you know, where you know, six out of ten people are going to die from it. This is not the bubonic plague. We need to kind of put it in perspective. You also uh, said, you know, you mentioned that we're kind of herd animals. We're also social animals, and lately, uh, social has been social distancing. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's that a big factor. It isn't is, it? and I, you know, I talk a lot about that with my friends and patients about the fact that we are fortuitous in a way that we have social media, and there are ways of interacting. You know, you can play a game online. You can do things as a, a group without being in a group. The one thing I'll caution is that, as we talked about earlier. Stay off the news 24-7, right. you know, watch for the disinformation in the social media. It's important to try to maintain as much normality in your life while still practicing so, so, uh, social distancing. People are getting very creative these days with social interacting, like maybe a virtual happy hour or just connecting with grandma and grandpa over the internet. Thank goodness we have the technology to kind of ease some of those, uh, those anxieties. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a changed world. I mean, we were talking about that earlier, you know, 20 years ago, none of this would have been available to us to be able to do a lot of the things as we're able to do. For instance, telemedicine, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years ago, we couldn't do telemedicine. 98% of the patients that I saw today were telemedicine. Dr. Maloney, is there anything historically, a lot of people were saying, well, this is just like the pandemic we had in uh, World War I, or 1918 or so. Is there, are we, we're not, obviously the numbers aren't getting there yet, but are there similarities? There are, and the good news is that we did learn some things from, from those epidemics, and I think the, the main thing to realize is that it did, they, those did get over. 
the entire population was not wiped out. People did live through it. People survived it, and it went away, and the world was, was able to go back to normal. But I think that one of the things that we've learned in retrospect from those pandemics and epidemics is the, the importance of the social distancing. So we kind of joke about that now a little bit and talk about standing our six feet away. There's actually science to that, and there's actually, you know, if you look around now and see where there's more cases of coronavirus than others, it's in places where the, the, the population density is higher, in places like New York City where they're still packing in the subways like as if you know there was nothing nothing wrong and I think that the thing that we learned is that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and so do the social distancing and maybe that'll prevent the need for something else right, and social distancing is nothing new I read that back in the 1790s during a yellow fever outbreak in Philadelphia where thousands of people were dying they basically even though they didn't know at the time that it was carried by mosquitoes they told people don't shake anyone's hand uh, some people, if you, if you see someone come on the sidewalk, walk in the middle of the street. So that concept is nothing new. And, and, yeah. and also I think it's important to realize that you can't equate the, you know, the, the Spanish flu from the First World War. Several other factors were in place. We had just come off the mini ice age, so a lot of the um, nutrition levels of people was much lower. They didn't have the reserves of food that we had. Also, you know, secondary infection, right? You got like bacterial pneumonia, you died because you didn't have antibiotics. We now have a sports and nobody had a respirator. They didn't mm -hmm. exist. Right. So it is, I think sometimes people look at the past and equate it and that increases the fear level going back to that anxiety because we are not that generation. We do have a lot of technology and abilities that we didn't have back then. And let's talk about that. Dr. Jerry, maybe you can weigh in on this a little bit. Some of the technology that is helping medical staff right now to help um, the people who have symptoms, the severe symptoms. Yes, uh, as has already been alluded to, uh, it is a very, very different landscape that we now occupy. Uh, at that time, uh, there was no extensive support for people who had respiratory difficulty. Now we have that. Uh, we've learned a lot in terms of the use of antibiotics for secondary complications. Uh, there are drugs currently that are in the pipeline and that are already in trials that may help these individuals. And it is a very different disease than 1918. I think what should be underscored, in 1918, that disease primarily hit a younger population. This disease is just the opposite. In 1918, it was known as the blue flu, that in 24 hours, many people took a major turn for the worse. That is not the case with this disease. So although there are parallels in terms of prevention, and that's already been said, uh, social distancing worked then and it will work now, it is a very different disease. And that disease was far more deadly than this disease. I think we have to make sure that people understand that more than 80% of people who get this disease are going to have relatively mild or negligible symptoms and they will recover nicely. Uh, so that has yeah. to be underscored. Yeah. Yeah, I think the All right. Yeah. The latest data on that that I looked at before I came because I knew I was going to be on TV <laughs> uh, was that 96% of patients who are actively have the coronavirus now that we're aware of have mild symptoms. Only 4% are serious or critical. Okay. So 96 to 4, you'll take That's those odds lot. at Vegas any day of the week. All right, all right, we'll ask all three of our doctors to uh, stick around. We have much more questions, especially from our viewers, coming up a little bit later. Now, as the coronavirus outbreak continues, people do have a lot of questions about a variety of topics. 211 is a national referral service that helps people find answers to their questions. The 211 hotline, which is also known as Helpline, is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week to field your calls. The staff there has been fielding a number of calls about the coronavirus. Tom Foley, the director of Healthline Services, says it's important for people to get the correct information. They may just kind of need some reassurance of what's going on. Um, others are asking questions about symptoms. Uh, you know, what should I be watching out for? Now Foley tells us that the staff has noticed an increase in calls since the outbreak. And you can visit the 211 website at nepa211.org. You can even text your questions to 898-211. Just make sure to text your zip code first. And still to come on the special edition of Eyewitness News tonight, more of your questions. And education at home, how Eyewitness News hopes to help with maybe a lesson or two. And the most important advice during this coronavirus pandemic, practice good hygiene, wash your hands, Cover those sneezes and coughs and call the PA Health Department with any questions.
You're watching special coverage of the coronavirus response presented by Eyewitness News. Welcome back to the special edition of Eyewitness News as we answer your questions concerning coronavirus. The COVID-19 pandemic is not only creating some health and safety concerns, but also fraud and crime concerns. Federal, state and local law enforcement are warning residents now to be on alert for those individuals who are trying to profit from this pandemic. The yeah, I-Team's Andy Mahalschik joins us live from Wilkesbury tonight with details. Andy. And Nick and Candace, I'm told it's a growing problem and expected to get worse. Now, I spoke to law enforcement officials at every level of government, federal, state, and county. They all had the same message. While most of us are out there trying to protect ourselves and our family from COVID-19, there are other people out there trying to steal our money. And the COVID-19 pandemic has many people thinking about the health and safety of themselves and their families. And would-be thieves know that. So says David Freed the United States Attorney for the Middle District of Pennsylvania. It's the same sort of scam using COVID-19 as a basis. Freed says these con artists realize that many people may be preoccupied with COVID-19 and they may be more easily fall victim to a scam. Folks that are using uh, uh, robocalls to make fraudulent offers to sell respirators and masks, you know, fake apps that if you, if you give them certain information will install malware on your computer, phishing emails asking for money. They're taking advantage of the vulnerability. People are scared and they're falling for this. Luzerne County District Attorney Stephanie Salvantis talks about a scam that is particularly disturbing. Then you have people who are calling saying that they're hospital personnel and that um, they may be, uh, uh, they may test positive for coronavirus because someone they know has uh, gotten it. So if you want to get a test, please provide your credit card information. Both prosecutors offer up this advice. You know, I put out something this morning just reminding people to not share financial or personal information unless it's with someone or a business that you trust. And law enforcement officials say these con artists, these scammers, play basically a numbers game. They know they reach out to as many people as possible, and eventually the odds are somebody, maybe a small group, will fall prey to their scam. Reporting live at the Luzerne County Courthouse, Andy Mahal, Chicago Witness News. It's amazing. People can be so just cruel at a time like this. Andy, thank you. And we have some more information on how you can report scams on pahomepage.com. All right, joining us again in our studio is Dr. Gerald Maloney, Chief Medical Officer, Geisinger Hospitals, and Dr. Matthew Berger, who is a local psychiatrist. And joining us remotely tonight, Dr. Jeffrey Jerry, who is an infectious disease specialist and Senior Vice President, Medical and Academic Affairs for St. Luke's Health Network. Well, we've got a couple of questions from our Facebook page here, and this one, first one comes from Corinne from our Facebook. She said, do you think that chloroquine will be a good medicine to treat the virus and if not what medicines are doctors trying to help out those who are very ill let's um, throw this one out to dr jerry uh thank you uh first of all all of these medications that have been touted are in trial phases and a lot of what you hear is more anecdotal uh, unfortunately there's been a run by the public on chloroquine through pharmacies and what one has to understand that this is not a benign drug and several people in the United States have already died of overdoses. So at this point in time, again, rather than trying to self-treat yourself or obtain medications to do so, make sure that you're in contact with your physician. Some of these drugs will not turn out to be helpful. And as I've already said, in some cases, they've already been shown to be harmful if they're taken in the wrong way. Dr. Jerry, a quick follow up on that point. Is it possible that the solution, the vaccine, whatever it could be, might be a, co a concoction, a combination of several drugs? Is that a possibility? If you're speaking about a vaccine, it's not a question of drugs. Uh, it's a question of something that would bolster your immunity. And there is a lot of fast track effort in terms of vaccine development. I think there is at least 25 different areas that I'm aware of right now that are international to try and develop a vaccine for this. I think what's well to keep in mind though, no matter how fast track these are, nobody is going to predict that these vaccines will be widely available for the current outbreak. It may be a year from now because they have to undergo some extensive testing to make sure that they're both safe and effective. 
Dr. Maloney, this one for you. Another question from our viewers on Facebook. I've heard that when you get the COVID-19 virus, you're supposed to stay at home in a separate room in your house. But doesn't that just set up for everyone else living in that house to also get the virus? Well, the point is that you need to remain distant as, as you can from people. So everybody really should assume that they're positive when they get sick rather than worrying about being tested to prove it. But if you're able, if, if you think about it, the social distancing actually has some science behind it because the particles are spread via droplets that come out when we breathe and those normally travel about six feet so if you can stay further than six feet away from people if you can limit the time you're in close contact with people to just a few seconds to a few minutes that's fairly effective in preventing the spread okay again we have another question from our Facebook page will the highly anticipated warmer weather maybe spring or summer allow COVID-19 to diminish Dr. Maloney so I don't think so I okay. think that you know we think that it's going to follow the same pattern as influenza does but I don't think that we can make that determination most of the time we think that in influenza season part of the reason is because we're staying inside and not and that's how we're getting it and once we can open the windows and get outside it really hasn't been that bad we've been outside a lot and the, the virus is still growing and it's growing in places where it's a warmer climate to begin with. So I think that the, the normal life cycle of this virus is just going to be a little different. Right, Dr. Berger, let's include you in this discussion now. We've sort of talked about this a little bit, um, socializing. People aren't being social. They're not going to work. Um, what can you talk about in terms of the impact that is going to have on their mental health? Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> isolation is very hard on people. I mean, one of the things we do when we want to punish somebody is we put them in isolation, right? You're, if you're in jail, you get isolated. So isolation is very hard. Uh, I think it's, we all have to come to terms with the fact that, again, isolation doesn't have to be isolation using our current technology. Um, and I think, again, goes back to the idea of being as normal as you can possibly be. If you work out every day, find a way to work out at home. I mean, obviously the whole Peloton thing, you know, where they do the, the, the uh, and, and most gyms locally are offering workouts that you can do online. Uh, you know, socialization, you mentioned the virtual happy hour. Um, you know, those kind of things that you can do to interact and socialize. Also, this is a great time, honestly, to do one of those things you've never wanted to do. Learn to play the banjo, read the great American novel, <laughs> you know, clean out that closet that you wanted to clean out. Don't sit on the couch and catastrophize. Don't sit on the thing and wonder, when am I going to get this next? Who's the next person to fall? You want to make sure that you, again, keep your mind occupied, mm -hmm. not focused on the illness because you can make it a lot bigger than it really is. And again, I'm not trying to minimize the impact, sure. but you don't want to make it the be all and end all. And you know, the other thing is this country has a tremendous amount of redundancy. We're seeing people like runs on milk and toilet paper and stuff like that. This is not going to shut down all of American supplies. Uh, that, that we talked about the herd mentality. Well, somebody sees someone buying eight rolls of toilet paper, they think, oh, I should buy eight rolls of toilet paper. This is classic too. panic yeah. buying. Exactly. Yeah. It's panic buying and it's, it's creating a fear that builds on itself. Sure. You know, the, you know in, in London during the Blitz, right? Mm -hmm. Churchill was out there walking the streets and saying, let's be calm and keep our lives normal. This isn't the Blitz. Yeah. Okay. All right, doctors, thank you. We've got more questions, too, that we'll uh, ask you in the later parts of the show here. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic is causing a significant decrease in phone calls at the Women's Resource Center in Lackawanna and Susquehanna counties. And survivors or victims could be at home with their abuser. Eyewitness News reporter Cody Butler talks with experts. In a time many are working from home or asked to stay home due to the spread of the coronavirus, it's unknown how many people are being quarantined with an abuser. The main motive of any batter abuser is power and control. And that means that they are constantly uh, monitor monitoring where the person is, what they're doing. Amy Everett says 8,000 calls come into the Women's Resource Center from Lackawanna and Susquehanna counties each year. That's an average of 153 calls a week. During the COVID-19 pandemic, it's down to around a dozen a week. That to me was a sign that there may be people out there who are in um, some really dangerous situation. Survivors of domestic and sexual violence just are, you know, stuck at home like all of us and they're not able to call. Peg Ruddy says in her 30 plus years at the center, this is a first and is worried. The pandemic could be causing a stressful time for the normal person. Victims or survivors could be experiencing a much higher stress level with no way out. We all think about home as being safety and that is just a myth. 
in many of our communities. If you are being abused or just need someone to talk to, call the hotline number at 1-800-257-5765. Both women have a message for survivors watching. We will bring you help. We will get you out of there. You can call and rely on us 24-7. We will do whatever we can to keep to keep you safe. We are here when there is an opportunity. In Scranton, Cody Butler, Eyewitness News. The Women's Resource Center says opportunities could be like going to a different room or maybe going to the grocery store to call the hotline. If you're looking on the center's website and you feel an abuser may be threatening you immediately, you can quickly push the emergency escape button in the bottom right hand corner that will automatically redirect you to a different page within seconds. And we have a link to their website on our website. Of course, it's pahomepage.com. Well, the virus forced the closing of schools all across the Commonwealth, so home is now the base for learning. Parents are getting a crash course in reading, writing, and arithmetic. And there are many online aids helping with at-home learning, and now Eyewitness News is joining in. Meteorologist Stefano DiPietro is sharing his love of science and weather with an online version of his Stefano at School. And here's a preview. As we get ready to flip the calendar from winter to spring, we'll be entering the heart of severe weather season here in northeastern and central Pennsylvania. And something we've become all too familiar with over the last couple of seasons are tornadoes. We've seen the damage they can create, but exactly how is a tornado itself formed? Well, it all starts with the wind direction. In a severe weather event, we're looking for wind direction changing with height. That being down here at the surface, wind blows one direction. Higher up in the atmosphere, wind starts to blow in the opposite direction. When we have that wind direction changing with height, right in between, we start to get some horizontal rotation. And what this is, is actually the early stages of what will eventually be the birth of a tornado. Think of thunderstorms as big vacuums. They suck in a lot of air. It's that updraft that lifts that rotation vertically. And when we do that and that rotation gets faster and faster, what we get is the birth of a tornado. That's pretty cool. Now you can see the online version of Stefano at School on PAHomepage.com. And then once school is back in session, Stefano will be visiting classrooms again with his presentation. There is much more to come on this special edition of Eyewitness News. We'll answer more of your questions. Plus, we'll take a look at the impact of the virus on the primary election. And a big reminder, Pennsylvania American Water is advising customers not to flush those sanitizing wipes, even if the label says they're flushable. That can lead to sewer backups and in-home plumbing issues, which may be very expensive to repair. We'll be right back. You're watching special coverage of the coronavirus response presented by Eyewitness News. Welcome back to our special coverage, coronavirus response. The COVID-19 pandemic is impacting virtually all aspects of our daily lives, our elections included. State lawmakers approved legislation today moving the April 28th Pennsylvania primary on to June 2nd. Now this is out of an abundance of caution. The ITM's Andy Mahalschik joins us live from Wilkes-Barre tonight with details. Andy. 
Well, good evening, Nick. In Kansas State House and Senate voted unanimously to move the primary from April 28th to June 2nd because of COVID-19. That bill now goes to governor to be signed. He is expected to sign it. Also, election officials all across the Commonwealth are urging voters to vote by mail this year because of COVID-19. State Senator John Udichak voted on various pieces of legislation, including pushing back the April 28th primary from his district office in Nanticoke. It's the first time in the history of Pennsylvania that the Senate has conducted business remotely. He says election officials from around the Commonwealth wanted the primary delayed. There's no question they would not have been prepared to handle a fair uh, election. There's no question of that. Didn't have the staff, didn't have the resources, and it wasn't the right thing to do in terms of public health. In Luzerne County, election officials say moving the primary was a must. The most important thing is it gives our primary workers a little more time to get ready here. Everybody's a little concerned, obviously, with the COVID virus going on right now, and people may not be coming out. So this will provide our workers, provide our polling places a little extra time to make sure that we have necessary resources uh, in order to have a fair and honest election. And for the first time this year, people can vote by mail. Pedri says they have seen an uptick in requests for mail-in ballots. Prior to this virus hitting, uh, we had about 700, uh, but in the past couple of weeks, we've received over 200. Sarah Panetta manages a donut shop in Nanticoke. Customers can only pick up their orders. She says she never could have imagined the health concerns would impact the election process. It's something that's definitely not to be taken lightly. It's something dangerous. Um, I mean, nobody is excluded from it, pretty much. And lawmakers say if need be, they could once again change that June 2nd primary date. They'll see how, what the situation with COVID-19 is as we get closer to June 2nd. And once again, Governor Wolf is expected to sign that legislation into law. Reporting live at the Luzerne County Courthouse, Andy Mahalshik, Eyewitness News. All right, Andy Mahalshik reporting live for us tonight. Thanks, Andy. Of course, you can always keep up to date on the latest, too, on PAHomepage.com. All right, we want to continue our conversation now with the doctors and answering more of your questions. Joining us in the studio is Dr. Gerald Maloney, Chief Medical Officer, Geisinger Hospitals, and Dr. Matthew Berger, local psychiatrist. And joining us remotely tonight, Dr. Jeffrey Jerry, Infectious Disease Specialist and Senior Vice President, Medical and Academic Affairs for St. Luke's Health Network. All right, our first question here, it's another one from Facebook, and it's twofold. It deals with test results. Is there any news of a more rapid results test, maybe three to five days waiting. It's not really good for one's mental health. Dr. Jerry, do you think you could answer this one? Yes, there is really lots of progress on all fronts being made with testing. Uh, currently, there are a number of platforms that can actually return a test within 45 minutes to an hour. The problem is that they're not widespread in terms of the reagents. And uh, so a number of our facilities are now doing some of these tests in-house with a, a much more rapid turnaround time. And I might also add that the commercial labs have stepped up their game. So whether it's Quest or LabCorp, uh, they're now telling us that in some cases they can get that turnaround time to as little as 36 hours. So this is obviously an evolving situation. In some cases, many of the reagents are being sent to areas that have a high density of cases like New York City or Seattle or certain parts of California. But it's rapidly developing and it already is present in our area. Dr. Jerry, we, the word reagent, we've heard that a lot. Explain quickly what that means in kind of layman's terms. Yes, so in order to do this test, you need to have certain chemicals that contain things that would react with the virus that tells you that you have this. And so they're not transferable from one kind of testing mechanism to another. So each company that has a testing mechanism has specific chemicals that are required in order for you to validate a test and to make sure that you're getting a true positive or negative result. And that is what's in short supply. And again, I wanna point out that that is a situation that's rapidly being remedied and we're hoping that very shortly, nobody will have a seven day turnaround time. Okay, let's get back in studio. Dr. Maloney now, um, the question we've heard a lot, how long does the virus last 
on surfaces and does it depend on the surface? It does and that's a great question because it does depend on the surface. It'll last for maybe 14 hours on some surfaces. Interestingly, copper seems to be what it lasts the least amount of time on, oh. which is, but it's still about four hours. This is where hand washing comes in because people will say why if it's a respiratory virus is hand washing important? Because it's on the surface, you put your hands on the surface and then we all touch our face. Mm -hmm. You know, sit around and look at each other, You're all, you, we, we can't help ourselves but touch our face and then we just kind of inoculate ourselves with the virus. What, do you know what materials it would last the longest on? You know, I don't know the answer to that offhand, okay. but uh, it's copper is the shortest, and I just found that very interesting. Uh, I, I know, I know uh, plastic. Stainless steel uh, yeah. is one of, the, uh, one of the surfaces that it does last on. I think it's very important to point out that although the virus may be viable on surfaces, that has not been proven to be a good mechanism of transfer. Uh, as has already been said, this is primarily a droplet disease from respiratory secretions. So just because the virus is present on a surface, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's how you can get it transmitted. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, okay. That's All important. Right. Another question. Could this virus resurface? Do you think the strain will be weaker, Dr. Maloney? It's hard to say. The DNA is changing and the DNA has changed because coronaviruses have been around forever and, and this is just the coronavirus that the DNA has changed. So one of the things that's under surveillance right now is if the DNA in this particular, you know, strain of the virus is changing. And I think that that's something that's too soon for us to predict. I don't know if we'll have this again next year or not. If we do have it next year, we may have immunity from people who have had it this year and we may have a seen by then, but we may not be done with this for some time. We're kind of making this playbook up as we mm -hmm. go along in some But that's the thing, we don't know what we don't know. Right. This is all new and it's all yeah. changing so quickly. Dr. Berger, let's get to uh, this question. We uh, talked about people staying home. Uh, the kids are at home. They're being schooled at home. For a lot of families, this is the first time they've ever been in close quarters in their house for this extended period of time, other than, say, a vacation. How does that affect the family, and what can they do to sort of, you know, get a little more elbow room? It is really tough. I mean, I think one of the things we're seeing a lot of is that as you kind of, for lack of a better word, get on each other's nerves, mm -hmm. your frustration tolerance goes down. And so you tend to argue more. You tend to be sh more short-tempered. You don't let things go as much. Um, <clears throat> this happens with husbands and wives, but also with kids. I mean, you know, let's face it. If you are you know, have not spent you know, 72 to, uh, you know, a week in close proximity with three kids who have nothing to do all day, so to speak. And we tend to take it out on our loved ones. We tend to get irritable. We get short-tempered. Things that, again, that we let go. Now we have more tempo to let go. We start to argue. We yell. And, you know, we it was kind of following up on that battered woman thing. Mm -hmm. We don't want to see tempers flare to the point where people get physical with each other, which can happen, or it can put tremendous strain on relationships. We actually see that a lot when when a, a husband or a wife retires and now they're home and of course the person who was home had no idea how to stack the cans appropriately now that this person can yeah. show them how to do it after 40 years. So I think it's important to have techniques to give yourself distance, okay. downtime, mm -hmm. so that you're not on top of each other. You know, find ways to have to the kids have some time by themselves and husband and wife can go somewhere and do what they need to do to kind of regenerate. I'm a big believer in things like yoga, calming techniques, breathing exercises, exercise, yeah, those kinds of Walk out of the house, yeah. yeah absolutely, yes. get out of the house for yeah. a little bit. Anything, walk the dog. Take a break, yeah. All right, doctors, thank you. You know, even before uh, coronavirus prompted calls for social distancing, one in four older adults was affected by social isolation. But now millions of older adults are left with limited or no social interaction. Eyewitness News Health Beat reporter Mark Killer joins us live tonight from Kingston with that side of the story. Mark? Nick and Candace, Kingston Active Adult Center helps keep seniors healthy, active, and independent. But with centers like this closed now because of the coronavirus crisis and more seniors becoming shut-ins, it's threatening their physical and mental well-being. Empty senior centers are a sign of the social isolation many older Americans face during these uncertain times. The closures contribute to a problem all too many seniors already face. Well, you know, Mark, when, when we think about it, we think about the rise of social isolation and Pennsylvania in terms of an aging population ranks eighth and over one million Pennsylvanians are at risk of loneliness today. That risk can take a terrible toll, according to the AARP Foundation. Prolonged isolation is the health equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. COVID-19 coupled with social isolation means that vulnerable seniors face two risk factors coinciding. Ryerson recommends one way to avoid social disconnection while social distancing is to take what she calls a friendventory. 
sit down and remember the names and contact information for former colleagues or coworkers, individuals uh, who you attended school with, and reach out first. Seniors can make a phone call, have a video chat, or even send an email to set a date for a virtual coffee hour together. Ryerson also recommends contacting community organizations that help seniors meet their needs. It's whether that's meal delivery or volunteer services that are offering grocery delivery during this time. But Mark, equally important is for us to check in on our loved ones daily, to contact five older adults each and every day during this virus and hopefully beyond. AARP Foundation has a digital platform called ConnectToEffect.org. It features vital information on social isolation, as well as tips on how to stay connected during the coronavirus crisis. Head to PAHomepage.com where we have a link to that information. In Kingston tonight, Mark Hiller, Eyewitness News. Great information mm -hmm. tonight. Timely, too. Mark, thanks. Sports and the local and national level, of course, have stopped in their tracks because of COVID-19 concerns. And A.J. Donatoni has a wrap-up on the local sports scene. And a reminder, your federal and Pennsylvania tax deadlines have been extended to July 15th, and you can find more information on the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue and IRS websites. You're watching special coverage of the coronavirus response presented by Eyewitness News. Welcome back. One of the first signs that coronavirus was a serious threat in the United States was the suspension or cancellation of all sports leagues from the pros to the high school level. Eyewitness News Sports Director AJ Donatoni takes a look at how our local athletes and teams have been affected by the spread of the virus. Everywhere you look, sports have been put on hold. We have no games to watch, no competition to follow. Three major North American pro sports leagues have been suspended. March Madness was canceled, and so were spring sports at the college level. Most recently, the Tokyo 2020 Olympics were postponed, and it's likely they won't occur until at least the summer of 2021. This week, we caught up with Valley West grad Danielle Grega and Wyoming area grad Mark Minichello. Both are Olympic hopefuls in field hockey and javelin, respectively, and now the future is in doubt. But on the other hand, additional time to train could be a blessing in disguise. Obviously, it's the right decision. They had to do it um, for everyone's health and safety. Um, we're not really sure how it affects us moving forward. Um, I'm sure at some point it'll affect our 2021 competition schedule, but at the moment we're not really sure. For selfish reasons, I'm actually kind of happy the Olympics got postponed because for me, I feel like I'm growing every single day as a javelin thrower, so getting an extra 12 months to prepare will only be that much closer. For those still in high school, spring sports haven't started and winter championships are in limbo. The Loyal Sock boys and Dunmore girls are two of our 11 local teams that reached the state quarterfinals in basketball, but those championship runs are on pause. I think we're all mentally tough guys. We can stick through this. It's, it's just it's, it's a sad thing to do right now, but I mean, 
we just got to fight through it. I've been pretty upset about it. It's definitely a hard pill to swallow, just looking back on all four years and how much fun it's been, especially this year. This team's right. really special, and we've grown into a family. So for it to end like that, it would be pretty hard. The revived XFL was forced to cancel its remaining games after just five weeks in operation. West Scranton grad Matt McGloin got another chance at pro football with the New York Guardians. The former NFL quarterback was grateful for his opportunity to be back under center. For me, I enjoyed being you know, the guy again. You know, if it, if it was just for a short time, I really did. That's one of the reasons why I went back is to be a, be a starting quarterback again and to play at a high level. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, in a first-year startup league, um, you know, to get that TV exposure um, and, again, to play at a professional level was a, was a fantastic opportunity for everybody. Among our local pro teams, the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins remain on hiatus along with the NHL, and the Scranton Wilkes-Barre Rail Riders do not know when their season will start. The Major League Baseball season is postponed until at least mid-May, and that trickles down to the minors. Doug Davis is going into his first season as Rail Riders manager. He's a Bloomsburg native and now needs to make adjustments with the start of the year, still TBA. You know, this is an experience that none of us have ever had to go through before. I'm sure <laughs> when we do get get going. There's probably going to be some unique rules that are put in place that may be much different than what we're used to uh, and, and what we have been used to in the past. And not even the great outdoors have been immune from the fallout of coronavirus. Trout season in Pennsylvania has been affected. Regional opening days have been bypassed. April 18th is now the singular opening day throughout the Commonwealth and other changes are being implemented to keep fishermen and women safe. We've actually eliminated the display requirement for fishing licenses, okay, but we've gone a step further with all the concerns right now and we're saying that so that you don't have to feel like you have to go out and purchase a, a, a physical license, if you purchase it on your device or on your phone or whatever, you don't even have to print it out. As long as you have it there and you can show me either a PDF file or some image of your license, that would be sufficient. And getting back to the Olympics, to put that postponement into context, only three times prior have the games been canceled. All three occurrences were during the World Wars. This is truly an unprecedented time for sports. Reporting in Wilkes-Barre, Luzerne County, A.J. Donatoni, Eyewitness News. A.J., thanks, and A.J. will keep us up to date every day on sports happening on Eyewitness News and online at pahomepage.com. Okay, let's back to, back to our panel now of doctors for more questions. Joining us in studio, Dr. Gerald Maloney, Chief Medical Officer at Geisinger Hospitals, and Dr. Matthew Berger, a local psychiatrist. And joining us remotely is Dr. Jeffrey Jerry, Infectious Disease Specialist, Senior Vice President of Medical and Academic Affairs for St. Luke's Health Network. Thanks again for staying with us, gentlemen. One of our viewer questions on Facebook says, this one impacts their children. One viewer writes, how should I explain the virus to my children? They are scared and I don't want to make it any worse. Dr. Berger, let's start with you. Well, I think <clears throat> being honest is really important. You know, I think kids know when you're trying to fake them out mm -hmm. or when you're trying to sugarcoat something. So I think it's important to be honest with them, but put it in perspective. I mean, you don't want to make this a terrifying event for children because this could develop into long-term anxiety disorders. We know that um, chronic low-grade fear or anxiety in children can develop into long-term psychiatric issues uh, further down the road. So be honest with them, explain them what the disease is in terms that they can understand, but also give them the facts that, you know, mommy and daddy are probably going to be fine, the odds are we're going to be good. You know, you want to make it as honest and transparent, but at the same time as least fearful you can. And I think also don't let your own fears kind of overtake them. And also, you know, little ears here, all our little prince and princesses are listening to us when we talk, we may not be aware of that. So kind of monitor what you say around your friends and family, because if, you, if you're scared, they're going to pick up on that. So again, your own sense of pervasive calm and that everything's going to be okay will trickle down to them. If you're walking around fearful all the time, it's going to make them fearful as well. Yeah, they'll definitely pick up on this. Dr. Jerry, this one I'm going to send your way. One of our viewer asks, if you've had the virus, can you get it again? Well, that's obviously a good question. And uh, so far, the answer is unknown. Here's what we do know that other coronaviruses, not this novel coronavirus, but other coronaviruses that we've known about since the 1960s have caused the common cold. In fact, are responsible for 30% of the common cold. And what we do know from that is that the immunity that one gets to those viruses for a common cold is not long lasting. So there is certainly a possibility that that may apply to this. But again, 
this is a novel coronavirus. And so the exact answer to that is unknown and we'll just have to wait and see. Dr. Jerry, Dr. follow up. How about people who say something like, well, just, you know, what, just give me this thing now. And so I can get the, you know, become immune to it. That's not a good idea. No, uh, obviously uh, prevention is far better than cure. And we've already said that there isn't anything that we could actually rely on for a cure of this disease. And although we know that more than 80% of people will do well with this, there are certainly exceptions to that. And one of the things that has now been learned and pointed out that even in the young adult population, which traditionally are relatively spared with this disease, there have been some very serious cases. We've actually seen that locally. And in fact, there has also been deaths. So that about 6% of even young adults will have a serious uh, outcome with this. So prevention, far better than trying to get this and dealing with it. All right, Dr. Maloney, your turn. We're talking about the folks on the front lines, doctors and the nurses. How do we protect them? How do they deal with the stress also of the crisis? So the stress, again, is, is related to the stress of the unknown. And now we have the stress of, can I bring this home to my family? And can, you know, how bad is this going to be? And what if I have somebody at home who's pregnant? Or what if I have somebody at home who has a, a, an immunity disorder and things like that? But I think that uh, you know one of the things we need to keep in mind is that infectious diseases as a whole are not new. So every day before this, we're taking care in our hospitals of people with tuberculosis, of people with influenza, of people with uh, bacterial infections that are resistant to most antibiotics. And so we know that the universal precautions, we know that the things that we use like masks and gloves, we know that they're effective, we know what to do, we just need to keep on doing it. And I think we need to, sh to, to understand that again, as the doctor said, this is what we do. This is sort of what we signed up for. You sure. know, the nursing staff and the medical staff, and you know, all the way from the techs to the to the to even the you know janitorial staff who work in hospitals. Mm -hmm. We kind of knew that this going in, that this is something we're going to deal with, and we kind of it's in our psyche that we're able to handle it. Having said that, we're not immune to it, and I think it's important again to self monitor. So if you feel that anxiety, if you feel that worry, talk about it with your coworkers. Go to your supervisor. You know. It's important to identify and deal with. Don't just try to hold it all in and suck it up. Group talk is really important. It's a way of diffusing anxiety. So if you have your coworkers, have a conversation of how you're dealing with it. Talk about your fears. That helps to diffuse it. I was just going to ask, what are some of the techniques that our viewers at home and people who have to be on the front lines, our law enforcement and, and the like, how, what are some tips that you can give them to kind of settle their nerves? Well, again, know the real facts. That's really important. You know, don't get sucked in by the, the fake information that's out there. Discuss it with your colleagues. Mm -hmm. Use appropriate precautions. False bravado is not a great idea. But at the same time, don't catastrophize it. Discuss what the appropriate responses are. And again, if you can diffuse your anxiety by talking about it amongst your friends and peers, it's a really good way to do it. And again, keep a safe space in your head so that you can go there so you have a way of, of decompressing. All right. Some final thoughts from our medical experts when we come back after the break.
You're watching special coverage of the coronavirus response presented by Eyewitness News. We're back with Dr. Gerald Maloney, Chief Medical Officer, Geisinger Hospitals, and Dr. Matthew Berger, local psychiatrist. Joining us remotely tonight is Dr. Jeffrey Jerry, Infectious Disease Specialist, Senior Vice President, Medical Academy, and Affairs for St. Luke's Health Network. Okay, uh, we just have a few minutes left. We want to talk about if they lifted the restrictions. We don't know when that's going to be, but how soon after that that we know that the virus is gone for good? I don't think, first of all, gone for good is a really, really strong term. I don't think anybody really knows. I mean, I think what we're talking about is decreasing the rate of, of, of growth and trying to tip that curve. I mean, we always have to balance, I guess, the economic livelihood and the fact of the, the sort of national well-being with the medical issue. But I don't think anyone knows when it's over. Mm -hmm. I would certainly agree with that. Uh, when we start stop seeing a lot of community spread, then we know that we've really made a major dent in it and it may become a, a negligible issue, but it may not be totally gone for good. We were talking a little bit in the break about how the testing and the numbers, it's not, un it's not known if we've maybe had this before, but now because of the testing, we're becoming a lot more aware. Yeah, we're not testing. Well, we do know. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. We're not testing as many people as, you know, some people say we should, and I don't know the answer to that, but the fact is if we were testing more people with milder symptoms, we may find that more people have had this, so it may seem that this, the rate of seriousness, if you will, is, is less than we think. Dr. Berger, will our lives at some point start to kind of feel normal again? It certainly doesn't feel that way now. I, I, I think on some level this may be actually game-changing for us. I think that society will go back to some degree, but I think we're going to have a different perspective on things. You know, one of the things I always say is, is that we, we live in a society where basically most of us are safe, warm, and dry most of the time, and we've gotten very complacent. Mm -hmm. I always say when I, when I write my book, it's going to be the Mongols are not coming, because we have this fear factor, and I think we've gotten kicked out of that complacency. You know, it, it, I think it may be good for us in the long run in terms of kind of making us more aware of some of the concerns, but at the same time making us more able to handle those concerns because we live through it. Sure, making changes all around in our lives in many different ways. Right, certainly our lives were changed after 9-11. You can't go on a plane after 9-11, everything's different. Yeah, I mean, I've always wondered why hand washing has become such a novel thing. Right. Should we <laughs> should have been, been doing, doing it all, all, all along? We're certainly yeah, aware of more about what yeah. we touch and what we do in our actions. Well, doctors, we want to thank you very much for being with us for our coronavirus response special. Dr. Jerry, thanks for being with us remotely, too. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And, Great information. And you can keep up with the latest developments on coronavirus on pahomepage.com. There we've got the latest from the Pennsylvania Department of Health and information you need to know to keep you and your family safe. We'll also have this program on our website in case you missed it. Thanks have for nice watching. Time.